really, I would say 9-11 was kind of a thing where I felt like it really wasn't a choice for me anymore. I lost my best friend. We were together for nine months. We watched each other's back all the time. I jumped out, I landed on my back on another parachute. The instructor yeah. tells you, you've got 10 seconds to get off this bus and nine seconds are already gone. Once a week, you got a 10 minute call home. You could call mom or you could call your wife. You could call your kids, but you got 10 minutes to call home. You saw a lot of horrific things after the fact, but in the moment, in the light of explosions and illuminations, boy, you saw some guys really raising hell. I remember my time when I was thinking about enlisting, and I really didn't know anyone in the military, but the people that I did know, um, I really looked up to. In fact, I was in second grade during Desert Storm, and I got a, a letter from Sergeant Mark Badger, um, and he was from Janesville, 82nd Airborne Paratrooper. And uh, I just, I, to this day, I'm 36 years old, and I can remember getting this letter. So, you know, I, I think there was a clear transition at some point in my life where I went from idolizing someone like Shaquille O'Neal to, um, you know, it was like one, my dad, but also um, learning about service members and like I said, first responders that really, um, until you're in it, you can't understand like what they're giving up and what they're taking on. My father had leukemia for 10 years. Um, he was an Air Force uh, vet as well. Uh, he served in 59 to 64 and uh, when he was dying in 1985, uh, he asked me, when you graduate, all I want you to do is spend four years in the military. Four years, just sign up and do four years. Uh, it'll start your life off and you'll get to know things that you wouldn't normally know and you, need, you just need to do this. So his dying wish was for me to join the military. And he said, make sure you join the Air Force. <laughs> And uh, so I did. I, I said, okay, Dad, I will. And he passed away right before I graduated. So when I graduated in, in 86, uh, I signed up at the age of 17 and joined the United States Air Force with my mom's consent. Uh, went off to basic training. Kind of his dying wish, and I stayed for f almost 15 years. So, um, you know, it was an experience that you can't get anywhere else. I was going to uh, enlist in the Army after I was hired into General Motors and I got my year in and everything. And that's the way it went till Friday, Good Friday, 1968, when I met this, this young lady and we kind of bonded and uh, I thought, well, I'm going in anyway, it doesn't make a difference. So I, I waited till they drafted me. When I graduated from college, I received a notice that uh, I had to report for a lottery drawing back then, it was, uh, you had a draft at age 18, uh, you had to sign up for the selective service. And so at that time went out to UROC uh, and they had the big lottery wheel and they, it was all in a basket and they pulled the numbers out. My number was 105. They wouldn't tell me that night, they said we'd well, have to report to the selective service office. So I uh, did go down the next day and she uh, did inform that I'd be going relatively quickly. I have uh, 10 brothers and sisters and there was five boys and we were all in the service. Two of us in the Army, one in Navy, one in the Air Force and one in the Marines. I <laughs> rented a farm uh, prior to the service but I started in March of 51 on the farm, and, and in January or December of 51, I was noticed for a physical, so I went to the physical and got a notice that I was to report for service on the 2nd of January of 52. But being on the farm, they deferred till March, and then the 5th of March, I got my notice to report the 25th of of March, and which was my 21st birthday. Back then, if you got drafted, you were in for two years, 
and then you were in the reserve for five. But if you enlisted, you were in for three years and then out completely. So that's why I enlisted. My father was in the Army. My grandpa, who I have never met, was in the Navy. That's kind of why I went the Navy route to kind of, I guess, get in touch with him, so to speak. Um, and Top Gun was popular at the time. <laughs> so, I didn't go in right after school, so I had the summer between high school and no, October 1st is when I actually left for basic training. I believe it was when Edison Junior High was first built. We were the first class in Edison Junior High School and I was on the Edison Junior High football team. We had a Marine officer that was a, our football coach. And that's what kind of inspired me for the Marine Corps. Um, coach Rao was his name. A lot of the area, Edison, people who went to Edison know Coach Rao. Um, and that's what kind of inspired me for the Marine Corps also. When I was in high school, you know, they tell you, try to figure out your life after high school. And, and I just was thinking about it and I said, you know, I wanted to travel. And so I went and talked to the recruiter and I signed up and probably a couple weeks after graduation, I went in. You know, I grew up in an Army family. My dad served for 32 years in the Army. He, like me, was, a, was an officer. Uh, he came into service in 1962, um, served in Vietnam on two um, deployments to Vietnam. Uh, but, you know, again, a 32-year career. So as a kid, uh, you know, I was born in Fort Huachuca, Arizona. I graduated from high school uh, in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. We lived 11 different places in between over the course of my first 18 years. Um, and, uh, you know, so as we, as we think about, you know, uh, the exposure to that military life, that military family, um, those military experiences, you know, I, I had that opportunity to, to see that growing up. Uh, and so it was just the natural progression or the natural next step um, that I was very, very comfortable in. And my dad, you know, frankly, uh, when I started looking at where do I want to go to college, what do I want to do, you know, I kept coming back to the service academies, either West Point, Annapolis, Air Force Academy. Um, and my dad, you know, said, you know, Mark, you, you haven't known anything about the military. You know, you, maybe you want to go to a civilian school and experience, you know, civilian opportunities. And I was like, there's no way. Uh, this is what I know. It's what I love. It's what I want to do. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I ended up applying to West Point uh, and, and got accepted and, you know, survived the four years. I'm not so sure I excelled, but I certainly survived. So I graduated in June 2001. Um, I had, I had already taken the ASVAB, talked to recruiters. You know, they were like showing up to my baseball games. Of course, my parents were like, very much they did not want me to join the military just not really because they had anything against the military but I understand it now as a parent um, you know you realize that it's a lot of risks you know um, however you know when I'm 18 years old I know everything so you know I remember waking up on the morning of 9-11 I flipped on the TV and uh, the first tower had been hit and then I was I called my mom I remember saying like hey are you watching this on TV and then as I was talking to her I saw the second plane hit on TV um, you know, and I, I think most of my friends and family, um, or anyone that knew me growing up, if, if, you would, if they hadn't seen me in 20 years and you said, hey, what do you think Justin's up to now, they would have totally told you I was going to be in the military or law enforcement. I think um, it's kind of what I always wanted to do, but um, really I would say 9-11 was kind of a thing where I felt like it really wasn't a choice for me anymore. I think most of my friends and family knew it. In fact, my... Uh, my best friend growing up, he called me like probably like 15 minutes after I was talking to my mom. And the first thing he said was like, hey man, don't do anything stupid. And I was like, choice is already made, Matt. Well, the first day, of course, was boot camp. Uh, it was intimidating, you know, getting, getting screamed at by your RDCs and, you know, you're getting transitioning from a civilian to now a member of the military. When you first get there, you're late at night, you're tired, tired. the instructor yeah. tells you you've got 10 seconds to get off this bus and nine seconds are already gone. That's your first order and from then on you're giving orders and orders and orders for the next 13, 48 hours. Yeah till you can finally start getting into your uniform and start your training, which lasts anywhere from 10 to 13 weeks. 
the new recruits come in, they get shots. A lot of times out in the basic training areas, we'd go out there about five o'clock, and we'd give 1,250 men a shot, or maybe two or three shots. If I had a penny for every shot, I'd have a lot of pennies. They made you behave, <laughs> I know that. There was no fooling around. But there was a great, great bunch of leaders, though. I was already in shape, so it didn't bother me much, but a lot of those young guys who were drafted, boy, it was, they took a beating. But they needed to be tough on you because they knew what was coming. Boot camp is divided into three main sections. Your first phase, you're learning all the basics of being a Marine. The uniforms, the marching. Haircuts. When you sit down to get your hair cut, it takes about 30 seconds. Common joke is, how do you want it cut? <laughs> and then they'd <laughs> proceed to take it all off. Your second phase is more tactics, and your third phase is more spit and polish, drill, uh, inspections, and then you graduate. I wanted to do infantry um, with airborne school and uh, RIP included, and uh, I wanted to do three years. You know, so it was like my basic training time plus three years. I was continuing to work, but I remember just like running and physically training, because I was like, all right, if I'm gonna do this, I gotta do it, you know? And uh, um, I thought if I could take away the physical stress part of it, then I could focus more on the mental part of like, uh, you know, being away from home for the first time, not knowing anybody. It's funny, because when I left from MEPS in Milwaukee, I'd never been on an airplane. Well, actually, I take that back. I had been on an airplane, but I went skydiving in Fort Atkinson because I, uh, you know, I wanted to go to airborne school. and. Um, so my dad, he's like, you never even been on an airplane, you know, and I was like, you know, you're right, so let's go. And um, to his disbelief, I, I went and did that. But uh, I remember getting on that airplane and flying to uh, South Carolina to Fort Jackson where I went to basic training and uh, leaning over to the guy next to me when we landed. And I was like, hey, man, I've never landed in an airplane. So I remember that being kind of like, whoa, this is not that smooth. But uh, also, you know, I think it was, uh, it was kind of excitement, but um, I don't ever really remember being like nervous, you know, because I felt like my uh, my family and my friends in this community had prepared me well for any kind of challenge I would encounter. But um, I'd say it was more a feeling of excitement and then sort of also disorientation because I was somewhere I didn't know. And I think that's all part of the, uh, the intended purpose of breaking you out of the um, life you've known and kind of initiating you into the life you're gonna live. So when I went in the Navy at age uh, 18, right out of high school, I was supposed to be a journalist. But uh, somewhere along the line, the first week in the boot camp, I was going through a classification and they asked me if I wanted to volunteer for submarines. And I said, well, what's that? And uh, they said, oh, they knew they had a hot one, evidently. Uh, you get an extra $50 a month and the best food in the Navy. Well, you know, when you only make uh, $75 a month, uh, another $50 a month is, is, is pretty good. One of the questions I asked them, well, you know, can I, can I still be a journalist? And they said, oh yeah. Well, a few minutes later, I just realized that I got took. So here I was in submarine school, and knowing I'd never, you know, become a journalist, but I had to do something other than chip paint. So then I volunteered to, be, to go to Torpedoman School, uh, where I went to Newport, Rhode Island, uh, uh, 1956, January, uh, cold winter in an old World War II barracks. And from there, I went on my first submarine, the USS Halfbeat. Well, in the military, you have a choice, their choice. If you enlist, then you got a better choice of choosing maybe something that you want. But the military, their thought is it's easier to retrain you for something you do not know than to try to retrain you for what you're doing. Because you got you kind of got your way set and that's the way you want to go. But the military don't want to do that. And uh, this is what they had enough for to make a school drafted in there. Like I say, there's about 40 of us all come in within about 10 days of one another. So, okay, that's gonna be a medical school and that's gonna to go to San Antonio, Texas. Well, I went in and uh, I was a baker. And so then they put me in as a baker and now I was a private. And when I got shipped over to Korea, 
that was a war zone. And if you were a cook or a baker, you automatically became a sergeant. So you went from $80 a month to $260, because $80 was just for a, just a private. So there's no place in Korea to spend money, so I sent it home to my mother. A little story about basic training. They had this community involvement thing where families took us in for Thanksgiving dinner. So the any kind of like civilian support that the veterans get is just awesome. I mean, we we were so it was just great to be out of basic training in, so, in somebody's home where we could act like a normal human being again because basic training is a little intense. And um, at West Point, it's a little bit different than uh, basic training. Again, if you enlist, you go to basic training, you learn how to be a soldier, then you go to your advanced individual training, learn your specialty skill, and then you head out to um, your unit for um, assignment and for work. Um, as an officer, you go to uh, either ROTC or to West Point to receive a direct commission or officer candidate school. Um, in my case, my, you know, I went to West Point from 1984 to 1988. That's the United States Military Academy. And their job um, you know, is to produce officers for the United States Army. That's what they do. So we entered with, uh, in 1984 with about 1,400 students um, in my class. We graduated four years later with 938. Uh, and so pretty significant attrition rate over the four years. Um, but, but once you graduate from West Point, then you receive a commission to serve in the United States Army. Army um, with a rank of second lieutenant and then begin your Army career. Basic training really wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't as hard as like I had imagined it to be, um, but I will definitely say that the, the training for counterintelligence was much more difficult than anything I had done in my life to that point. When I went through airborne school, it was actually the birthday of the airborne when I was there, so I got to meet some veterans that were um, part of the early test platoons for jumping out of airplanes and uh, it really, I already appreciated um, that era of veteran and all veterans really that went before me. Um, but I remember talking to those guys and uh, funny story, they're asking me about jump pay and I'm like, yeah, it's like $250 a month. And they're like, that's crazy. It was like 50 bucks a month when I had it and that basically doubled my pay. So I remember thinking like, man, these guys are just, so matter of fact, you know, really the greatest generation. And uh, um, so when I when I graduated airborne school, to have those guys there and to become part of that um, kind of storied brotherhood, you know, that a lot of people look up to, it was a very proud moment for me. Um, probably one of the proudest, just because it was. Uh, you could almost hear like the um, I don't want to say like the echoes of the past, you know, just being at the same place all these other guys were and girls were, and uh, then also having those guys from the test platoon there, it was like, you know, it's kind of like seeing your like living, breathing hero, the people you looked up to. In October of 73, I was deployed on the U USS Iwo Jima and sat off the coast of Israel for 30 days during the Mideast alert when Syria and Israel fought the 10-day war. At any moment, we could have gone ashore to help Israel had they needed the help. But it got so close, it came within hours, but Israel was able to turn the tide and we were not called in. During the Beirut bombing, I lost two members of our unit, one was a friend. It's very difficult to establish friendships for some because of that fact that it, you could lose them to wars or engagements of any kind around the world. It was very difficult to lose friends. Mainly I wasn't in country, uh, I, was, I was on the ship. At the time, uh, it was the USS Kitty Hawk. We were based out of Yokosuka, Japan. Um, so we got the call as soon as you know the uh, uh, the planes hit. We were in SRD, so our ship was down for maintenance. 
we cleared everybody off the ship that didn't need to be on there and we rolled. Um, so first, Iraqi freedom, you know, and enduring freedom. Uh, we were, I was in both of those. During that time, everything was locked down. So no internet, no phones. So the people that were on the ship is the people that you only were able to uh, speak with and talk to about anything. Um, we, the closest we got was three miles from, from shore. I mean, you could still see bombs and explosions and stuff for where we were at. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty nerve wracking actually to actually be that close, but at the same time, you know, worried about the guys that are actually on the ground and how they're doing, you know, because the ship that I was on, like I said, uh, was an aircraft carrier and we were doing uh, sorties and missions to keep them safe. So making sure um, that they're, you know, that they're doing okay. So, you know, when you'd see an airplane coming back, you know, we're hoping that our pilots are safe, but also the same as the guys on the, on the, on the ground. Went to Japan and got our field gear and stuff. Went by boat to then, to uh, ship to uh, Incheon, Korea. I remember you coming in there, you could see the anti-aircraft guns bursting in the air and stuff, which was scary. But we got on PT boats, because they couldn't come into the harbor. Got on PT boats and took us into shore. And it was late afternoon. <laughs> and we traveled by night, it seemed it was dark, an old rickety uh, train with just the seats were wood slats and stuff. We uh, were assigned to our outfit and I was assigned to the 75th Field Artillery, and those are, uh, they were uh, uh, the eight inch housers. And, uh, and then we got to our headquarters, to the headquarters of where the 75th Field Artillery, and I know we slept in squad tents, and it was late September, and it was cold. I know you wake up in the morning, and, that whole said inside of that tent was covered with frost. I, I was a, selected as a liaison corporal and I went to the Rock Army, which is the Republic of Korea headquarters, and I worked in the fire direction center. I took measure, uh, messages up to the, or mortar battalion, I should say, and uh, we had to go up. And that was always at night, and all you had was the little cat eyes. You could hardly see. I don't know how I found my way up there, but it was dark. And I know you could hear the mortar shells going and banging and banging around. You just pray that nothing hit you. It, kind of just, it was scary. But I, uh, I, I did that first with, with the messengers, and then I got the liaison corporal. I worked with the outpost, and they we were sending bombs and and artillery into this spot. And the Chinese uh, just walked in there like they were no fear at all. They were just by regiments. And some of you had went, because we were kind of down behind the hill. They went up on the hill and looked over there and it, that area was just lit up like a big city. Anyway, and then seven, six days later, <laughs> the war ended. And I, that was 27th of July, and uh, in the August, I came home. My orders were initially to have a six months active tour of duty. Well, I took a vacation out west. And when I was out there, my dad called me up and he said, I've got this big packet of materials from the Department of the Army. I, I said, well, open it up. And he did, and he says, well, I see your orders here have been changed. Uh, it, your, your duty requirement is, was six months. It is now 24 months. And I thought, well, that was a left hook I didn't anticipate. But what was happening then, and the reason those orders were changed, was something that was brewing in Europe at the time. And that's when the Soviets were threatening the Western Germany 
by putting their uh, tanks on the border and threatening to invade West Germany. And at the time, their target was thought to be the seizure of Rhine Main Air Force Base, which was the, one of the largest Air Force bases in Europe at the time. Now, this was in 1961. The government decided to take us all on a tour of Germany, and we were loaded into our deuce and a half trucks. And as we drove along in convoys on the roads, we'd go through the German towns, <clears throat> and we'd go over all of Germany, back and forth, going through the towns, and all the way along, the Germans would be lining the streets with flags, cheering us on. It was really quite exciting. In the southern part of the country, they would uh, have ships come in and load, unload onto trucks um, ordnance. It was napalm and bombs and all of this, and it had to be escorted from the southern part of the country to the northern part where they had a very large Air Force base. And these were ordnance, it was bombs and such, and that's what they would use to run missions over Vietnam. So uh, that was a, a three day. Um, journey from the south side of Thailand <clears throat> to uh, the, the Air Force Base was called Nakhon Phnom, and we just called it NKP. But uh, then after we uh, dropped off the uh, convoy there, then we would come back to, I was stationed in a small uh, town in um, central uh, Thailand, it was called Karat. A town, I believe, about as big as Beloit, but it had a heck of a lot more people in it. What branch did you serve in? 82nd Airborne. Did you choose to do that? Yes. Oh, yeah. They can't put you there, okay? They can't be a, put you in the, be a paratrooper. you got to volunteer. Did you like it? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's different. <laughs> what was your favorite part about it? Well, well, I did like jumping on airplanes, but so my last jump, okay, every jump went smooth, but the last jump, okay, we jump at 800 feet, okay, and uh, I jumped out, I landed on my back on another parachute, and I heard the. I yell, you son, get off of my chute, okay? I was flat on my back. I took, it was, I got up, I walked. It was every step, it went down, you know, it was hard walking on there. And when I got close to the edge, I went through the cords of the, of the other chute. And I went past the other guy fast, and then my chute came back open, you know, and And it happened so fast, when you jump at 800 feet, okay, it don't take long to hit that ground. But I, I heard, as I got close, was right close to the ground, heard a guy yell, hang on, and then the next thing I was on the ground, are you hurt? I said, no. All the other jumps went smooth, but I remember the last jump, okay. Were you done then after that? Well, uh, shortly after that, the 508 came back to the United States, so. What is his name? It's Elmer Gosta, Staff Sergeant Elmer Gosta. He was in the Army and uh, in the 42nd Rainbow Division, and he was wounded. He stepped on a mine, a shoe mine, in a minefield. To begin with, they asked for a volunteer to go out into the minefield um, to find the, where the enemy was at. And Well, they didn't know at the time it was a minefield. And nobody would volunteer, so my husband, he's a good one, he raised his hand, he said, I'll go. And uh, so he stepped on a mine, and then Doc heard 
started to go out there after him and they said, you can't go out there, there's too many mines around. And he said, I came here, he said, to save people, not to watch them die. He said, I'm going, and he went anyway. And he got to my husband, he saw that he was in shock, and he had, his shoe was blown off his foot, up part of his pant leg, and he said, I saw the raw meat and everything protruding, and he said, so I got my medical kit out and uh, poured sulfa drug into it, and then I gave him a shot of morphine for pain. And I said to him, do you think you can crawl out of here? And my husband said, oh, sure, you know. And he was, yeah, I'll go. And oh, he wanted to get out there <laughs> as fast as he could. But they had to be so careful of these mines all over. Doc Hurd went first, and he said, you follow me. Because he could see, he used to be a golfer, so he could see these little divots out there. My husband wasn't following like he wanted him to, and he looked back and he saw that that foot was catching on branches and so on and holding him back. So he said, just a minute, he said, I'll get behind you. So he got behind him and lifted his leg up, and they got out of the minefield that way. When he was wounded, I got on, um, it was the day after Easter, I had a um, telegram from our senator that he had paid the supreme sacrifice. And I was devastated. My neighbor across the street heard me on the phone talking to him and she said, I'm going to call the Red Cross and see more about this. So Mary Camps was our Red Cross uh, administrator here in Janesville at the time and she said I will call and I'll make a phone call and see what's happened. Well she called me back and she said he's he hasn't been deceased. She said he is in a hospital. Now I can't remember if it was either Germany or France. France. Was it France? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was quite a relief. The Half Beak was a uh, submarine that was uh, uh, built at the end of World War II, and then it was uh, upgraded, it was converted. Uh, uh, it, uh, example, it had four batteries instead of two battery compartments. It had, uh, they retained all four engines. So the Half Beak had a reputation that it could do things that other submarines uh, could not do. We were north of the Arctic Circle, we had paint on board, so they painted the boat white, uh, you know, floating on top of the water, which, which, was, which was quite a feat. The purpose of it was the USS Skate, one of our newer nuclear submarines, was coming around from the Pacific. And our job was to act as a camouflage, as a deterrent, because the area was not only loaded with, uh, uh, as you can be able to see here later maybe in the photo, of icebergs and ice, but also uh, Russian spy vessels. And also <clears throat> uh, several Russian submarines were in the area. So our job was to be a deterrent, uh, uh, get in their way. Uh, we also actually went underneath the ice uh, for one day, which was very unusual for a nuclear, rather for a diesel powered submarine. But we had double the amount of the amount the, we had double the batteries, so we could stay uh, we, we could stay submerged a little bit longer. Uh, the whole scenario was was that after we accomplished our feat, we were then supposed to paint ourselves black. However, from this photo, uh, here's a picture of the Milwaukee Journal about the same time with the same photo. So whatever we were attempting to do, uh, our secret had been blown, so to speak. And the next thing we knew, we uh, pulled into uh, Portsmouth, England. And in Portsmouth, England, they referred to us as the ghost ship. 
And here we were pulling into Portsmouth, England, painting, painted white uh, and referred to as a ghost ship. The Thresher was the first of a brand new class of submarines. And really, uh, it, it was a privilege to be on board because we could do things that no other submarine had ever done. We, 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 we could dive deeper, uh, we could go faster, up to 30 knots. It was really a, a test vehicle because for the first year, uh, we had very few weapons on board and all we did was we went uh, sonar operations, uh, we did fire some weapons, but we were testing our new sonar system. We were testing out our weapon system. The Navy wanted to figure out, you know, how well all the equipment was standing up or would stand up. So we went through a series of shock trials uh, in Key West, Florida, in 125 feet of water. Uh, and what the Navy had hanging was, there was a 12,500 uh, uh, pound bomb that, uh, we would run at periscope depth. There would be a regular movie type countdown from 10 down to one. Uh, at one, the captain, or at three, the captain lowered the periscope because we were at 60, 62 feet. And the bomb would go off uh, on one and uh, all the cameras were rolling and the, to see, you know, and then they monitored, you know, any equipment damage. Uh, we started out about uh, 180 yards uh, or more, maybe it was 200 yards uh, from, from the bomb, and uh, we did five tests. Uh, at the end of the sixth, five, fifth test, uh, they determined that they wanted us to do a sixth, which we did. I was transferred to instructor duty at that time, and uh, what happened was when the, when the thresher went to sea the next time, uh, I have uh, this uh, uh, article from the uh, Janesville Gazette, April 8th, uh, 1993, uh, which was the 30th anniversary of the uh, sinking of the Thresher when it went down during test trials uh, after the, uh, after the uh, yard period. <clears throat> what happened was, uh, determined later, is that evidently on the shock trials, uh, some piping in the engine room had been cracked. Uh, and the reason being, they, find, they, de they then determined that uh, here was a brand new, uh, the, high, the, the safest submarine in the world, but it had uh, a World War II air system, uh, World War II air check valves, and they had a, a flaw which uh, people would not admit it you know, prior is that when you went to test depth, and if anything went wrong, you sh they shut down one of the uh, <clears throat> what, what, one of the, the, the main steam valve uh, that, the, that controlled uh, uh, engineering equipment. And the problem was that main steam valve was in the lower level. So when, when the thresher got to test depth, uh, so evidently some pipes broke or cracked uh, salt water was being sprayed out. Uh, it uh, affected the electrical system and the reactor shut down. Uh, they figured that the boat made it about up to 800 feet and uh, then went down and uh, sank. And, uh, what the Navy analyzed was that they had to come up with uh, an, an, an new safety systems for submarines. So consequently, uh, that was called a sub-safe system. And it involved uh, uh, a complete separate air system uh, for emergency surfacing that was only used at, the t at a time if a submarine had an emergency that they would use that air. That way they would not run out of air. Uh, they completely redesigned the, air, the World War II air check valves because what happened on the Thresher was the air check valves uh, at about 800 feet froze up they froze open and uh, they, they, then they also ran out of air and so consequently the tanks flooded and, and that caused, uh, caused them uh, to perish. 
Fort Polk, Louisiana was uh, um, the home of the 2nd uh, Armored Cavalry Regiment, although we were light, so we were mounted in Humvees with um, machine guns, 50 fal machine guns on those, Mark, uh, on those Humvees, Mark 19s, tow missiles, etc., but very, very light. And so, again, a scout kind of platform and a scout mission. Um, and so I served there as a squadron uh, S3, an operations officer, uh, and also as a squadron executive officer. And while I was the executive officer um, in the cavalry squadron, uh, we got the word to deploy to Operation Iraqi Freedom um, in, uh, if you remember the Gulf or the Second Gulf War, or, um, the Global War on Terror uh, for Iraq began in March of 2003 with the evasion of, of Iraq. Uh, and so we actually deployed in April of 2003. Um, we moved uh, initially into Kuwait and then up into Baghdad, and we stayed in Baghdad um, until I left in July of 2003. So about four months. Uh, uh, combat deployment in Iraq at the time in downtown Baghdad, just outside of Sadr City, uh, and then uh, you know came back to the United States, uh, moved and worked in the headquarters in Washington D.C. of Human Resources Command, uh, and then uh, um, uh, moved to Squadron Command. So I became a Squadron Commander as a Lieutenant Colonel up in Alaska. So they uh, moved me up to Alaska with my family. Uh, we were assigned to the 172nd uh, Striker Brigade Combat Team, uh, which, uh, you know, if you haven't been to Alaska, uh, it's a whole new world up there. Um, you know, you get a uh, big appreciation for working in a very cold, austere environment, um, very harsh environment sometimes. But uh, we were only there for a year before they deployed us to Iraq. And so from 2005 uh, to 2006, uh, we were deployed initially for a 12-month um, cycle, and so, uh, you know, we got there. Uh, I was working actually for the Marine Corps out in Al Anbar province um, as a squadron commander, so I had uh, 550 of my own soldiers under my command that I took to the fight, um, and uh, we received attachments, um, two Iraqi battalions and other military attachments that were brought, uh, uh, brought to my combat outpost um, in a place called Rawa, which is on the Euphrates River in western Iraq. Um, and, uh, you know, we spent 12 months there. Um, and, uh, you know, our mission was to, you know, uh, destroy um, uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq that was operating along that uh, corridor, essentially bringing arms and equipment and uh, fighters from Syria into Iraq and then moving them along the uh, logistical corridor of the Euphrates River all the way to Baghdad. And so um, it was our job to stop them from doing that. And we, we had pretty good success during that time. Um, it was a difficult assignment, very austere. Uh, most of the uh, engagements were um, based on um, attacks with improvised explosive devices, so IEDs, um, and uh, lost a lot of strikers. Uh, our combat platform um, that, uh, that we were riding around in, it's a wheeled vehicle, um, but uh, um, got hit uh, once there, um, uh, did not have anybody from my crew uh, that, uh, that was injured, so that was good. All six of us walked away, um, but it destroyed the vehicle, so um, we were very, very lucky. But uh, during that deployment, um, you know, things in, uh, in Baghdad and frankly in Iraq were, uh, were becoming very, very difficult. The Shia, the Shia and the Sunni um, factions um, of Islam that was resident in Iraq were, were fighting amongst themselves and the sectarian violence, if you will, in Baghdad um, was becoming problematic uh, to the stability of Baghdad and certainly the country. So uh, they, uh, you know, they ordered our, uh, our unit, instead of staying for 12 months, they extended us uh, and sent us to Baghdad for an additional four months to help stabilize um, the area of operation. So our entire brigade, my unit being one of the subordinate elements, but the entire brigade of you know 3,500 soldiers uh, moved to Baghdad. And instead of being on a 12-month deployment, we were on a 16-month deployment. Um, during that time, uh, very, very, uh, you know, I, it was the certainly the pinnacle of my career from a professional standpoint to lead troops in combat. Um, uh, very, very uh, interesting uh, experience, if you will, but a very uh, um, rewarding experience to see American soldiers and American Marines and sailors and um, airmen uh, doing what they were trained to do, you know, for the betterment of our own country and another country. And, um, and doing it so, so professionally uh, and with humility and with um, a, a, an extreme sense of duty uh, and patriotism. Um, 
But during that time, I lost uh, six soldiers to, um, to combat-related deaths. I lost an additional three soldiers to non-combat-related deaths. And I had, 120, uh, I had 120 soldiers wounded. And that's a, that's a tough burden to bear um, for any leader. Um, certainly my responsibility um, for those losses. Um, I, I, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about those soldiers uh, or about um, their families. Uh, that uh, that lost them, and so uh, so that you know that was probably um, the the most significant experience that I had in the military. Um, but came back from that uh, safe, you know, totally um, uninjured, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, just very 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 proud of my unit and what the unit accomplished while we were there. 1990, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Uh, got called up and sent over to uh, participate in Desert Shield. Um, we, we arrived in October. Um, we were there until December, and I think December 20th, we got a letter from command that we were going to be there till April. So basically, we were supposed to come home, and we got a letter saying, by the way, you're, you're going to be here for Christmas. Your family's got to wait back. and. Here, you're gonna be here till April. Bummer for us, uh, but you suck it up, you continue working. Um, so, uh, all of that went down, we went in and did the nice desert storm attack, very few casualties, the uh, Iraqis surrendered. Um, but that's not the end of that story, and a lot of Americans don't know 2001, we were still going back there. Until 2003 when we went back uh, and had the war over there, we were still going back there. Every, I would spend six months there and then two months home with my family and then six months there, two months, six months. So you were in Saudi Arabia or in Turkey because of the no-fly zones and uh, no-fly zones were the two parallels above and below uh, Iraq. Uh, and the planes would continually patrol that area to make sure the Iraqi Air Force wasn't flying missions out over other countries for intel. Um, and so American public thinks it was over in 92 and all our troops came back. That's not how it works because uh, we still had to defend that no-fly zone. And, um, but in 1996, I went to Dahran, Kobar Towers, um, very, very solemn day for me in 1996. Um, so I was in, I was over there and my term was almost up. My six months were almost up and I got a call. My mom had a heart attack. Uh, they said, well, we need to get you on a medevac flight go, to go home. I said, well, if she had a heart attack and she died, it'd be better if I stayed here for an extra day and found out one way or another. So I waited for the call. They said, no, she's in the ICU. She's going to be okay, but she'd really like you to come home and see her. Okay, so then I jumped on her uh, flight out. I only had a week left. So I flew all the way 14 hours back to uh, uh, home, and uh, I got to my mom's bedside, and I took her hand, and I looked up at the TV. And the, it were in the ICU, so the volume's turned off. And a news is on, and it says bombing at Kobar Towers. My stomach just dropped. I reach in my pocket, and I pull out a piece of paper. It's the map of our facility. And I, I look up there, and I'm trying to figure out what building was hit. And uh, I found out it was my dormitory. Uh, 19 of my friends were dead, 150 wounded by a bomb that they created out of a semi-truck and pulled it up next to the dormitory and detonated it, put a 75-foot crater in the ground. The mental thought process for a person goes crazy. I should have been there. I should have been defending my my fellow troops I should maybe so I could have changed something maybe I would have seen something that they didn't 
And I, I think about it, I was working third shift, I'd have been sleeping with my roommate in that dormitory in the room where he died. I was lucky, I, it was somebody looking out for me upstairs. That's all I can say. Um, shook my world pretty hard. Um, I've never felt that way before that. I, even when my dad died, I, I can't even explain how that feels to just know that you were somewhere and those people are all dead now. It's It shakes you to the ground. Um, and I think it was only on the TV for like two days here in Beloit, but um, yeah, most people don't know that happened. Unbelievably, I got put in the company I actually wanted to be in, the unit. That's uh, 101st Airborne Division. Charlie Company, second of the 506. Uh, their base camp was Evans. Boy, what a great company, unbelievable. Of course, when we got there, we went through jungle training and everything, and, and that was tough. And then they put us with our company. And mine was Charlie Company, and I was in first platoon. And of course, we were cherries when we first got in there. Some of the old guys took us underneath their wings, and of course, we listened to everything they said. And that first combat sets the tone for how you're going to react the, the rest of the tour. And uh, once that battle happened, and that was 27 days after we got there, and I came in with uh, Bob Tarbuck, Steve Stanley, and uh, Bob Radcliffe, four of us cherries. That first battle, 27 days later, we were accepted. There's two kinds of fear, the kind that'll freeze and the kind that'll inspire. We were fortunate because we were inspired. <laughs> That's uh, the way it was with all the guys actually in Charlie Company. Very rarely did we have somebody that, that would freeze and usually when that happened they got a job in the rear, which is the way you want it. Also guys who snored, <laughs> that wasn't a good thing. Uh, we were out in the bush most of the time. 101st was uh, uh, legendary for being out in the bush a lot, a lot of combat. Well, when I, I was a, a rifleman when I first got there, but then as uh, when we first got uh, CA'd into the ASHA for this new, uh, it was called Operation Texas Star. It was uh, March 12, 1970. Uh, the AG gunner were right in front of me and the AG was uh, hit by a sniper and taken out. So they made me the AG that's assistant gunner. Uh, and uh, then when the gun uh, got short, then they made me the gun. And the, the funny thing about that is, is when he handed me the, his name was Doug Taylor. He, he said, you're gonna need this. Being 6'6", six, six, I kind of got it right away. Uh, so I was a machine gun uh, for quite some time. March 16th, which is, uh, one of my battle fatigue days, experiences, Steve Stanley was killed in an ambush. And what happened was we were set up, we had been hit the night before from a hilltop across the way. And so we snuck over there the next morning set up and we just got set up and I just finished loading the, the gun for RT, it was the gun then and I was the AG. Uh, an NVA showed up out from you to me away. And it was like gun smoke. And I already had my, my rifle on uh, safety off because we were ready for him. And he raised his and it was like gun smoke. And that, his bullet tore by my head before we, I eliminated him. But that one bullet, after the fight was over, uh, we found out that Steve was right behind us and he took a shot to the head, killed him instantly. Uh, that was uh, pretty devastating for us all. First uh, man we actually lost in battle. A uh, good friend to boot. Uh, there's a lot of things once you get there that you, you pick up on. Uh, the smell. Um, sign, of course. I was a hunter from James, James Wolf, Wisconsin here and a fisherman, so I grew up hunting. I was already a woodman and I could read sign. So that was a good thing. Uh, all of the guy, hunters that were in our company were really, really good in a bonus. Uh, on top of that, we could all shoot. And the, the objective was there was a mortar 
NBA Mortar Company on the other side of the hill, backside shooting mortars into ripcord. Our job was to eliminate it. We got up on the hill and we stayed there the first, first night. And then the next day we, uh, and this is the best shot I ever seen with a Laws rocket. We waited till the mortars went off and, and then you could see this puff just above the trees. Uh, Jack Tree here lobbed a, a Laws rocket down on that position and it hit dead, dead center. And then it stopped. Well, we knew they were gonna be ticked, you know, so we, we were thinking we were coming to get us off there. Well, they didn't. They made us stay there another night, which just blew the old guys' minds. And at that time, there was only a handful of uh, what I'd call old guys, uh, because we had gotten a lot of fresh troops because of all the guys we lost and unwounded. And uh, anyway, we dug in, set up. We were ready for them. Some of us were ready for them. Anyway, I was on guard at uh, three o'clock in the morning. A little bit after three, I heard a radio. See, I had the radio at that time. There was only like three radios on the whole hill. And from the other side of the hill, I heard a guy say that he had a, he had a figure in front of him. And immediately I went down, two, had two guys in my position, uh, Don Holthausen, Bob Tarbuck. I shook Holthausen, I was just reaching for Bob Tarbuck's foot, I just grabbed it and all oh, hell broke loose. I mean, there's like a wave, uh, five or six uh, RPGs blew in, blew me right off my feet down the hill. I uh, scrambled back, jumped in the fox, blew my claymores, and then tried to assess what was going on. And th those RPGs had hit the command post, which was right above us, maybe 10, 15 feet away. And I, I mean, it was horrific. I thought they were all dead. Um, and then I heard somebody on the radio. Uh, so I, got, I thought it was Cooper from Ripcord. So I got on and told him what happened and told him we need Cobras now. And uh, all hell was breaking loose all this time. And uh, I popped a hand flare because I wanted to know where everybody was, you know, where the enemy was, where were they? Well, they were right in, the, in with us. They were already there. Everybody opened up on them and, and boy, it was a fight. I had never been in anything like that in my life. And uh, but the, we all rose to the occasion. <laughs> and uh, you saw a lot of horrific things after the fact, but in the moment, in the light of explosions and illuminations, boy, you saw some guys really raising hell. <laughs> you know? And I can laugh at that now. I couldn't laugh at it then. I couldn't even say nothing. I don't think nobody could after it happened. I mean, uh, when it was all over, I had lost, Bob Radcliffe was gone. A whole bunch of friends were gone. Hewitt, Radcliffe, Zoller, Converti, Lentz, Harbor, Herndon, all dead. A bunch of guys wounded. Uh, I was peppered with shrapnel and covered with uh, blood and human flesh and debris and everything else. I mean, the ground was red with blood. And uh, I couldn't hear nothing. So I just went on, did what I did. And uh, that's what everybody did. And then they flew in uh, some guys to secure the hill and get us out of there. And they even said, it says we were like zombies. Well, we were like zombies because we couldn't hear nothing. <laughs> you know, we just did what we did. And then we got our buddies off and then they, they medevaced myself and everybody else that was uh, wounded and are dead out. I was a mortar man, a uh, mortar, 80, 81 millimeter mortar. It was um, mounted in a, a track, a vehicle, and it spin. 360 degrees. They give you the degrees where they wanted you to fire the rounds, and you'd put it on your gun on the on the gun, and that's where the rounds would go. Uh, we had tracks and tanks for the first five months I was over there, and the only thing we really drew was like small sniper fire, an occasional booby trap, and we pulled road security on Highway One, which was the only highway over there, right on the coastal. Um, and then we got a colonel from the Big Red One. We called him Mad Dog Hooker. <laughs> he felt that we weren't getting enough kills, so to speak, with our vehicles, because we had so much firepower for where we were at. And so we went on foot from there, and then we got all the action we wanted. <laughs> a lot of trouble, a lot of firefighting. For a while, we had a hump that mortar tube out in the jungle, and the tube weighed 65 pounds, the base plate 
weighed 65, and the tripod that held the tube up weighed 65 pounds, and everybody in the motor squad had to carry two motor rounds under pack, and they were 11 pounds apiece. And you had to carry three days' supply of food, because uh, you got resupplied every three days, and I had seven canteens strapped to me somewhere, and they weighed a pound apiece. And then um, in monsoon season, what we call ground leeches, and you'd have to disrobe yourself and pull them off in certain areas where you didn't want them anymore. Um, you had fire ants, you had spiders crawling around you at night. Um, you had what they call a green viper snake, twice was, once was sleeping on my chest for warmth. And we called it a step and a half for one cigarette snake. That's all the time you had for if you bit you. You're always hungry, always thirsty. You thought somebody threw a pile of bricks on your chest because the air was so heavy. Uh, you had dysentery so bad that you couldn't walk, you know, because of the, uh, because you had it, you know. You, but that didn't negotiate you getting going back to the rear, you know. You just had to stick it out, you know, because we weren't getting replacements. I lost my best friend. We were together for nine months. We watched each other's back all the time. We, they had split us up, see, and that's we knew we were in trouble. This guy, this one captain, didn't like us. I have no idea why. And he split us up, and we knew we probably going to be the demise of one of us, and it happened to be him. Um, How did you find out about it then? Oh, I heard it on, over the radio. They called in that Moody got shot. Um, and they said he was dead, and it, it didn't really, I was, I was really hurt. Um, that took, that put me in a stoop for about three days. I just, but I kept on telling myself, if I don't pull out of this, I'm next. You know, you, I just, um, <clears throat> before I went over, um, I had my, this is probably the last, uh, before I went over, I had my brother-in-law and a real good friend of mine give me a New Testament and underline the proper scriptures under it to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. And what I did was I just put it in my pocket, hoping to slow down the bullets, you know, if it ever came. Um, this particular day, we got in a firefight at the bottom of this mountain, and quite a few of us got killed. Um, we still had to do the mission, go up this mountain, and it was straight up. And on the way up, there's this soldier ahead of me. He had a book sticking out of his backpack called God Smuggler. And I was a pastor, I was a guy in the 50s who smuggled Bibles into Russia. He was in World War I, got shot in the foot, and he received the Lord in the hospital there. And then he went from there to getting Bible smuggled into Russia the rest of his life. Anyway, that led me back to a book I had in my pocket, and they had the underlying scriptures, and so on that mountain, I received Christ as my Lord and Savior, okay? And then when that happened, the fear, he took the fear away. I wasn't scared anymore, which was a big, a big issue. I mean, I'd be laying there at night on the ground, I could hear other soldiers, you know, other combat, crying because they're so terrified and scared, and you know, not, all, not a lot of them, but a few. And then, but after that, I wasn't scared anymore. I shouldn't be here other than, you know, when you walk into a couple ambush, you figure it's over, you know, because there's so much lead flying, and, um, and I'm here. <laughs> uh, that's about all I can, the good Lord got me home. That's, that's the truth. <laughs> If you were in Saudi Arabia or if you were in Turkey, uh, once a week you got a 10 minute call home. You could call mom or you could call your wife, you could call your kids, but you got 10 minutes to call home for free. When we went into port, we always found like a pay phone and I always called to collect. Sometimes I didn't get the time right. Because you know, I'd be calling here, it'd be at nighttime over there, it'd be two, three o'clock in the morning. 
We had internet most of the time out to sea uh, nowadays, so you, we all used you know Facebook or um, when we got into ports, we'd find some place with Wi-Fi or something. So. A little different. Just a little. <laughs> you got to remember 1987 when I went in, 86 when I went in, there's no cell phones, so you're not calling. On the, it, it's a landline, uh, probably a rotary phone. <laughs> That was that, and letters. Write lots of letters and send them back and forth about what's going on. Uh, you know, I can remember when I first went in, like calling cards were still a thing. So I remember going to the the payphone every Sunday. Um, but you know, then as I, I sort of I was right in that era where cell phones were coming around, so and like a satellite phone and things. So for the most part, you know, with the internet and things like that, communication was um, pretty, you know, available based on the nature of the work. Um, you know, there were times that I had to just sort of either dodge around a question or uh, just kind of like make up some something that wasn't necessarily a lie, but it wasn't it wasn't very detailed. It really wasn't um, indicative of what was really going on. To entertain ourselves, um, there's actually a couple guys from the Wisconsin area that I met up with on the on the ship, and we actually started a band together. So we played whenever our downtime was. We ended up getting together and played, try to kill some time while we're. Uh, you know, floating around. We made our own entertainment. Um, playing cards, of uh, course, you know, playing cards, uh, sitting around. If you're in Saudi Arabia, it's a dry country and there's no drinking, so we had a giant Olympic-sized pool there, so we could go swimming. Um, but at one point, uh, we ordered some am an amplifier and some speakers, and we did kamikaze karaoke by the pool on Saturday nights. Um, just something to do. You had to create your own thing. Uh, we would work out, play board games, cards, uh, video games, uh, watch a lot of movies or TV shows also on our free time. Um, we did go on the rear a few times, like Eagle Beach, to relax, a uh, hot meal and a shower and a band and the ocean and swimming and whatever else went on back then, you know. This is the South China Sea, it was in the back of the fire pace. You can go down there and swim, we'd dig a pit, and they'd get, sometimes they'd get a half a cow from the local village and we'd barbecue it, you know. And beer was free, uh, a fifth of booze, I was feeling could have been pretty good there, it was a buck and a half of any kind of booze that they had at the PX, and but pop, we had to pay 25 cents a can. <laughs> the place I was in Thailand, we were, uh, when I first got into country, we couldn't go down into the town for three weeks. And then during that three weeks, they showed us um, uh, videos and told us what to do, what not to do, what to avoid. When we were coming back, uh, me and a, a friend, I don't know, I, I got this one. we uh, came across a local national who was uh, riding on his elephant. So we stopped and we, we said, can we have a ride on this elephant? So that's me and my, my friend from Ohio. His name was uh, Tom Rush. So that, the local national said, yeah, we could <clears throat> take you on that. And uh, we offered to give him some money, but he didn't want any money. He wanted two cigarettes. So he got two cigarettes and we got a free elephant ride. Japan was beautiful. Then we got in a carriage, and here's this guy with these long poles, and there's seats in the back. And so we sat in there, and then he took you all over. Well, all of a sudden, we decided to lean backwards. <laughs> we leaned backwards, and his seat's up in the air. <laughs> That's bad news. We shouldn't do things like that, no. I was in a Jeep in the front of this convoy, and I said, well, Maybe we should take a little break, give the men a rest, rest stop. So we said, yeah, let's do that. I said, I see a large building here with a, looks like a big parking lot. We can all fit in there. We probably had about 20 do's and a half. And then we pulled in and then in the parking lot, and all, the, all the troops got out, lit the cigarettes and were standing around and all of a sudden this whistle went off. I said, what's that? 
out of the doors of the factory came all these beautiful German women. <laughs> and they started fraternizing with the, our, our troops. And, and we said, well, let's get them back into the truck. <laughs> it was difficult getting them into the truck. The routine, especially for long deployments, was different. Uh, you didn't tell yourself you were going out to sea for 67 days. You told you broke it, you broke you broke the time down into weeks. One time, uh, some friends of mine and I, I, I was in charge of the torpedo room. We uh, we brought a case, of, we each brought cases of cokes aboard, three of us, stored it out in the outboard, and we told ourselves that for the first two weeks we would not have a coke. And then every other day we would have a Coke, and it would last so long. That worked through half of the case. <laughs> and then finally one day we said, the heck with it. Everybody else was down there, and everybody shared the Coke with us. And, uh, they showed uh, Star Wars Episode One in there for us, or you know, they'd get first releases of movies before the public got to see them. We'd get them, they, the movie companies would send them to us so we could see them before everybody else. Um, I was part of a group that put on a play. Uh, we built a set and, and uh, we did uh, Don't Drink the Water. We did a couple plays there. but Mark Kramer, he was actually um, married at the time, so he had a house on post that we could like go over there. And he was actually a chef for Carabas before he joined the military. So he would actually make us real food so we didn't have to eat the junk from the mess hall. So we'd hang out at his house, eat good food, watch movies, whatever, and then my other uh, best friend, Ben Daniel, he's a big movie fan, so I think we probably saw every movie in the theater twice, and that's the way we kept ourselves out of like going out to the bars and getting drunk and getting in fights and getting Article 15s. We stopped at Laverno, Italy. Now naturally when we pulled into port, the majority of the Marines and the sailors were going into town for wine, women, and song. Pisa was 12 miles, Something clicked and I went, Pisa, Leaning Tower. So I jumped on the bus and there it was. And so I can honestly say that I chose to go see something of historic value that I probably would never have gotten in my lifetime without joining the Marine Corps. Well, it was nice to have been serving for the country, and, but I'm glad I was back home again. So <laughs> I remember coming into Seattle, Washington. We didn't have no big welcoming people there at all. There was some can-can girls, and that's it. And I got to Toma like four in the morning. My folks lived in Wilton, which is about 15 miles away. But I didn't want to wake them up, so I sat there in the train depot until about 7 o'clock and called them. So they came and got me. I had written letters back to other people who had left before me, and, and I wanted to ask the question, how long did it take you to process out? And I got um, answers back. It took me 18 hours. It took me 24 hours. It took me 36 hours. So you were prepared to wait that long to process the long process out of the service. So when we got into the Oakland Army base, we were in bleachers and I was in, fortunate enough to be in a small group. There was only 36 of us. And the, the sergeant that first addressed us, thanked us for his service and, and such. And he says, I'll ha this was at four o'clock in the afternoon. He says, I'll have you out of here tonight by midnight. So it, it was just about midnight and you had to give them your military ID card. He looked at me, he looked at the card, he cut it in half. And he paid me $336, and that was it. I was out of there. Didn't tell my wife I was coming home. I got a month early out because our unit went home, so I got to go home a month early. Then I was been there 11 months. I was in a cab. I went from you know the Chicago airport to the Rock County, took a cab from there to going home. I literally passed her on Sunnyway Hill. She was going this way, I was going this way. And I wish to this day the cat said, you want me to turn around and follow her? I wish I had did that, but I didn't. I said, no, let's just go to her folks' house. That's where, um, and they were shocked. No homecoming. Um, you know, I just, I got off the plane. My parents were there, um, which, was, which was good, you know, but, you know, it wasn't like, 
you know what you're seeing now with a bunch of crowds of people i mean it was just it was just me walking off a plane it was tough leaving the guys you know knowing all that stuff was going on anyway middle august i i got shipped back home i got all my stuff and they told me he says don't wear your uniform i don't wear my uniform you know well they were laying for you oh, well too bad i put my uniform on I go to Oakland, and here's this group of people. And I saw them, and I had to go buy them. And they had Vietnam veterans in there. Called me every name in a book. Baby killer, liar, criminal, I'd go on and on, you know, I'd just vile stuff. I told them, I said, I didn't kill no babies. You try to reason with them guys, and then they spit on me, and they actually attack me. I gets home, there's a big banner on the garage. Welcome home, Steve. That's what it was all about. All my family and friends were there. And that's the kind of welcome every vet should have. Not the one at the airport, you know. Um, for me, it was kind of a forced transition. I actually got out on a medical discharge. Um, you know, I came, I came home to like solid family, solid friends, um, very understanding um, about that transition. Took me a while to like kind of relax, I guess, is the way I look at it. Because I used to like call my mom at work and be like, hey, what do you need me to do around the house? I got stuff to do. I was just like, da 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 da, you know, going a million miles an hour. After he came home from service and that, he, he'd had a couple of uh, skin grafts on his foot. And uh, he went, they said, you'll never be able to walk or stand again for work, you know, for, for any kind of work. But he went down General Motors and applied and got a job. and. And he worked for, oh gosh, I don't know how many years before he finally retired. He also farmed 80 acres and worked yeah. full time at General Motors to support eight children. <laughs> yeah. He was a hard worker. He was a hard worker. He never gave up. No. And I applied for General Motors in 1973. And of course, he said, We're not hiring. You, you, you're just wasting your time. And, um, but I, I'd go down every day. At that time, you could sit in the office area, in the front of the desk or the, the counter, and if they needed somebody, they'd go, hey, you want to work? You know. Oh. And that's what happened. They hired me in, I think it was March of that year. I came back and I looked for jobs. I went down there. My brother was living down in Illinois. I didn't get no jobs and stuff, but I worked for butchering uh, chickens, produce, produce uh, in Wilton there a little bit. Was that almost a year, and then I came to Janesville in, in 54 and got into GM, and, and I worked there uh, 33 years. I came to school at Blackhawk Tech for two years. Uh, at one time I was the student body treasurer, and at one time I was the president of the student body for a very short time. I was studying accounting, however, at that time in 86, General Motors was hiring and I did get hired in. I became a, an electrician and I retired from General Motors in 2009. I was home for 30 days and then my pregnant wife and I went to Fort Carson, Colorado for my last duty station. And we lived off base and it was like an eight hour job. Uh, it was great. Boy, I had all kinds of things to look forward to. I didn't have any battle fatigue at that time that I, I recognized, but I already knew what it was because my dad told me, because he had it. His brothers had it. My brother-in-law had it. And uh, it's just, uh, but the thing that set it off was all of a sudden, they wanted us to go out and play war games. So we had to go out and to live on the prairie and do war games for a, a week. Well, after that, while you're out there doing that stuff, you're laying there looking up at the stars just like you did so many times in the Vietnam. And uh, you start thinking about your guys, what's going on and all that stuff. Well, it didn't, I didn't get much sleep. It wasn't like sleeping in my bed at home, you know. Uh, then when that was all over again, it wasn't but a short time later where I had these flashback type nightmares about March 16th. 
And then again, I had another one July 2nd. Then I went, and the, the last one, I actually jumped right out of bed, swinging and screaming, throwing grenades. Accidentally hit my pregnant wife, scared the heck out of me, scared the heck out of her. So I went in sick call, and uh, the doc at the area knew what happened right away. He says, you have battle fatigue. And then he said, what do you have got going on when you come home? when you go home, and I told him, and, and uh, he said, well, just keep all that uh, special stuff in mind until you figure out the NAM, and you'll be okay. Well, I knew that's what my dad told me, too, because my dad was all right, but he still had battle fatigue. So that's what I did, and we went home. We showed uh, our horses on the weekends all over the Midwest, and plus I worked on my grandfather's farm and then I worked at General Motors and I helped my mom and dad out when I didn't have no time for anything else. I was just a, I guess you'd say a workaholic. First night, um, when, we went to, when we went to bed that night, I mean, the next morning, um, my wife come to wake me up. And when she touched me, of course, I knocked her across the bedroom because, <laughs> and so for, a while she had to wake up her broomstick because I'd always wake up swinging, you know. And I was so, even once in a while I have recurrences that every once in a while, especially when the kids were little, I was so scared I'd, I'd fall asleep in the car. I was so scared that it hurt, you know. But eventually it went, it was totally gone. Uh, you know, if you'd asked me, I probably would have thought, I said, you know what, I'll probably be a firefighter when I get out, but then I really hadn't like shot any guns or anything. And then the military gave me that opportunity and I was like, man, I really like this. So. So I was thinking, all right, maybe I'll be a cop um, and uh, or look at something federal based on what my, my MOS was. So, But, uh, you know, I finished up school and uh, I was actually going through the process for um, the FBI and then Jamesville PD. And at that point, um, my girlfriend then, my wife now, we just bought a house. And, uh, you know, I was like, boy, I'm, I kind of like this, like being in my community, you know. So... Um, Got hired with James Lapidi, withdrew from the FBI, and uh, I will say that um, the experiences that I had in the military have come in extremely useful um, in my law enforcement job. You know, everything from um, the stuff in counterintelligence, you know, dealing with people and um, collecting information, to uh, like first aid. April 13th, 2013, here in Janesville, we had an attack where the guy attacked people with an ax. So uh, I was one of the first responding officers there, and um, we got in the house, and this guy had been attacked badly with an ax, and he had really grievous head injuries. But uh, it was interesting, because I don't really remember thinking about it too much, but I kind of just like went back to the combat lifesaver training and uh, ended up applying that training directly to this, this uh, victim. And, uh, you know, small part of saving his life, but. I don't know if I would have been able to process that information and react had I not had those experiences in the military. So, um, and I think that goes for every really veteran you see when, the, when a crisis happens, you, you always seem to see veterans stepping up. The military is not for everybody. It, it really, it takes a, a special person though. You have to have pride in your country. You, you're not in it for pay, you're in it for that feeling of being part of something bigger. You know, the military really is, uh, it's a snapshot of the great melting pot that is America. Um, people from various backgrounds, from different levels of social structure and economic background, uh, different races, different beliefs, different religions. If I look back on my career, the, the best thing about serving in the military is serving with these amazing Americans who choose or chose uh, to serve their nation, uh, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And so, um, what a great group of people. Um, it's about a population. Veterans are about 1% uh, of the population. Uh, and so, that's an amazing 1% of the American public. And so, I'm very, very proud of the, the time that I served, very pleased with my choice to serve, uh, and, uh, you know, look back on that time uh, very, very positively. Growing up, I was a slacker, not gonna lie. Uh, so definitely jo uh, joining the military put everything in a, into a whole new perspective. Um, you know, being respectful, um, having a goal. The experience really did mature me. And I will say this, uh, 
Had I not had that experience of serving uh, almost two years in the military, I don't think I would have been able to do as well as I did in law school. It really got me ready. It really honed my interests. It was definitely one of the best experiences of my life, um, especially being from Janesville, growing up in Janesville, never really leaving Janesville. Um, I thought I had it pretty well figured out. Um, and then joining the military, especially at that time, uh, kind of like flipped my world upside down and really um, gave me like a quick orientation to like life in the real world. And uh, when you make that decision, it's, it's like you need to be completely aware of like the weight that it carries um, and the weight it can carry forever. To see the nation now grasping the, the concerns of all the veterans is, is reassuring to me. And I'm very proud of the nation now starting to take a serious look at the veterans and their needs. I am very grateful that we have the freedom in the United States that we have today because the veterans paid the price. They were the ones that gave their lives and they were the ones that when they came back they were changed individuals because they fought for our freedom today and we must never forget what they did, the price they paid for our freedom. I, I love America, I uh, love Rock County, and I uh, am always each day grateful that we live in a free nation. But somebody had to pay that price, and I shall never forget them for their sacrifice. Just realize how, how good you have it in this country.